How long have sundials been in use? Sundials, which indicate the time of day by the shadow cast by a stick, pin, or other object. Usually on a horizontal plate, have been in use since before the 6th century B. C when both the ancient Chinese and Egyptians used the device to tell time. Sundials proved to be a fairly accurate indicator of the passage of time. But it has its problems, a sundial can be difficult to read. The markings have to be adjusted according to latitude, and the readings differ with the seasons. They remain popular as garden ornaments today. What was the Doomsday Book? It is an important document surviving from the reign of England's William I, c. 1028-1087, a Norman who had conquered England in 1066 to become king. He ordered the survey so that he could have a complete record of England's lands, property owners, and resources. He used this information to his advantage, even taking possession of some properties thereafter. The census is considered an excellent record of Europe's Middle Ages, 500-1350. What is a Horatio Alger story? It is any story about someone who, through sheer determination and good works, rises from poverty to wealth. During the second half of the 1800s, novels by American clergyman and author Horatio Alger Jr. 1832-1899, were extremely popular, he wrote more than 100 books including the Luck and Pluck and the Tattered Tom series. All of the stories center on a boy from inauspicious beginnings who, through hard work, clean living, and a little bit of luck, becomes successful. Alger's real-life experience working with orphans and runaways in New York City provided the foundation for his works, which inspired countless readers and fed into the American dream. That the United States is a land ripe with possibility. Though dead for more than a century, Alger's name lives on. Many Americans still describe an honorable person's rise from rags to riches as a real Horatio Alger story. How did the novel develop? Critics and scholars agree that it is French writer Gustave Flaubert. 1821 to 1880, who developed the modern novel into a conscious art form. Flaubert's Madame Bovary is recognized for its objective characterization. Irony, narrative technique, and use of imagery and symbolism. American writer, and naturalized British citizen, Henry James. 1843-1916, is acknowledged for having enlarged the scope of the novel, introducing dramatic elements to the narrative. Developing point of view technique, 
and advocating realism in literature. James's works include The American, 1877, Daisy Miller, 1879. The Portrait of a Lady, 1881, and The Ambassadors, 1903. Irish writer James Joyce, 1882-1941, considered the most prominent English-speaking literary figure. Of the first half of the 20th century, is often credited with redefining the modern novel. Joyce experimented with the form and revolutionized it through his first novel. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, 1916, and with his masterpiece, Ulysses, 1922. In which he developed the techniques of interior monologue and stream of conscious narrative. Writer William Faulkner, 1897-1962. Was the American counterpart to Joyce's experimentation with the form of the novel. The author of The Sound and the Fury, 1929, Light in August, 1932, and Absalom, Absalom. 1936, among others, Faulkner, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1949 stated that the fundamental theme of his fiction is the human heart in conflict with itself. This he explored by employing a variety of narrative techniques. Which, like Joyce's, departed radically from traditional methods. What is empiricism? Empiricism is the philosophical concept that experience, which is based on observation and experimentation, is the source of knowledge. According to empiricism, the information that a person gathers with his or her senses is the information that should be used to make decisions, without regard to reason or to either religious or political authority. The philosophy gained credibility with the rise of experimental science in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it continues to be the outlook of many scientists today. Empiricists have included English philosopher John Locke, 1632-1704, who asserted that there is no such thing as innate ideas that the mind is born blank and all knowledge is derived from human experience. Irish clergyman George Berkeley, 1685-1753, who believed that nothing exists except through the perception of the individual, and that it is the mind of God that makes possible the apparent existence of material objects, and Scottish philosopher David Hume, 1711-1776. Who evolved the doctrine of empiricism to the extreme of skepticism that human knowledge is restricted to the experience of ideas and impressions, and therefore cannot be verified as true? Where did Christopher Columbus first land in the New World? Columbus, 1451-1506, set sail from Palos, in southwest Spain. On August 3, 1492, and he sighted land on October 12 that year. Going ashore, he named it San Salvador. 
alternately called Waddling's Island, today it is one of the Bahamas. With his fleet of three vessels, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, Columbus then continued west and south. Sailing along the north coast of Cuba and Haiti, which he named Hispaniola. When the Santa Maria ran aground, Columbus left a colony of about 40 men on the Haitian coast where they built a fort. Which, being Christmas time, they named La Navidad, Navidad means Christmas in Spanish. In January 1493 he set sail for home, arriving back in Palos on March 15 with a few Indians. Native Americans, as well as some belts, aprons, bracelets, and gold on board. News of his successful voyage spread rapidly, and Columbus journeyed to Barcelona. Spain, where he was triumphantly received by Ferdinand and Isabella. On his second voyage, which he undertook on September 25th, 1493, he sailed with a fleet of 17 ships and some 1,500 men. In November he reached Dominica, Guadalupe, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Upon returning to Haiti, Hispaniola. Columbus found the colony at La Navidad had been destroyed by natives. In December 1493 he made a new settlement at Isabella, present-day Dominican Republic. The eastern end of Hispaniola, which became the first European town in the New World. Before returning to Spain in 1496, Columbus also landed at Jamaica. On his third voyage, which he began in May 1498, Columbus reached Trinidad, just off the coast of South America. On his fourth and last trip he found the island of Martinique before arriving on the North American mainland at Honduras, in Central America. It was also on this voyage, in May 1502 that he sailed down to the Isthmus of Panama finally believing himself to be near China. But Columbus suffered many difficulties, and in November 1504 he returned to Spain for good. He died two years later in poverty and neglect. He had, of course, never found the westward sea passage to the Indies in the Far East. Nevertheless, the Caribbean islands he discovered came to be known collectively as the West Indies. And the native peoples of North and South America came to be known collectively as Indians. Why was the development of the quantum theory important? German physicist and professor Max Planck, 1858-1947, originated and developed the quantum theory. From 1900, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1918. The basic theory is that energy and some other physical properties can exist in tiny, finite amounts, called quanta. Before Planck's work, theories of classical physics held that energy and physical properties varied continuously. Planck experimented with black body radiation. A black body is any substance that absorbs all of the radiant energy that falls on it, reflecting none of it. He concluded that radiant energy can be divided and the particles, quanta, 
would have values proportional to those of the energy source. Planck determined the relationship between the amount of energy that light has and its frequency. Along with Albert Einstein's 1897 to 1955 theory of relativity. The quantum theory forms the basis of modern physics. Since it was developed, the quantum theory has been applied to numerous processes involving the transfer of energy in an atomic or molecular scale, including in 1913 when it was used by Danish physicist and Nobel laureate, 1922, Niels Bohr, 1885 to 1962, to explain atomic structure. The theory has been used to explain how electrons move though the chips in a personal computer. The decay of nuclei, and how lasers work. How did the jitterbug get started? During the height of swing music's popularity in the late 1930s and early 1940s, there were at least 50 dance bands with national reputations and significant followings. Dance styles such as the jitterbug were based on big band music. The dominant form of American musical entertainment during those decades. The dance itself is a variation of the two-step. Couple swing and twirl in standardized patterns, which sometimes include acrobatics. What did the founding of Liberia have to do with the anti-slavery movement? With the goal of transporting freed slaves back to their homeland. Members of the American Colonization Society, organized 1816-17. Made land purchases on the West African coast. The holdings were named Liberia, a Latin word meaning freedom. The first black Americans arrived there in 1822. But the society's plan was controversial. Even some abolitionists and blacks opposed it. As they believed the only answer to the question of slavery was to eradicate it from the United States and extend the full rights of citizenship to the freed slaves in their new American home. Nevertheless, by 1860 11,000 freed black slaves from the United States had been settled there. Eventually a total of 15,000 made the transatlantic voyage to a secured freedom in Liberia. The country was established as an independent republic on July 26, 1847. What were the hallmarks of the Cold War era? At home, the hysteria of the Cold War era reached its height with the so-called McCarthyism of the 1950s. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin described it as one of the most destructive chapters in American political history. In early 1950 Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy, 1908-1957, of Wisconsin claimed to possess a list of more than 200 known communists in the U.S. State Department. The startling accusation launched congressional inquiries conducted by the 
Senators Subcommittee and the House Committee to investigate un-American activities. Suspicions of communist subversion ran high even in Hollywood. Where a blacklist named those who were believed to have been involved in the Communist Party. McCarthy never produced his laundry list of offenders in the State Department. And the sorry chapter was closed when, on live television, the senator's bitter attacks went too far. In televised hearings in 1954, the senator took on the U.S. Army. Determined to ferret out what he believed was a conspiracy to cover up a known communist in the ranks. Faced with McCarthy's slanderous line of questioning, Army Counsel Joseph Welch. 1890-1960, delivered a reply that finally disarmed McCarthy, saying have you no sense of decency, sir? If there is a God in heaven, your attacks will do neither you nor your cause any good. The retort was met with applause in the courtroom. Heralding the end of the communist in our midst hysteria. But the Cold War deepened during the course of the 1950s. As distrust on both sides was increased by the shadow of possible nuclear destruction. Both the United States and the Soviet Union funneled vast resources into the development of weapons systems. As each side believed deterrence would determine the victor in the Cold War. It would be won by the nation able to create weapons so powerful that the other nation would be deterred from attacking. The military build-up became an all-out arms race. Competition between the Eastern Bloc and the West spilled over into athletics, the arts, and the sciences. In 1957 the Soviets beat the West into space with the launch of the first artificial satellite. Sputnik, which they followed in 1961 by completing the first successful manned space launch. The United States responded by stepping up its space program and vowing to put a man on the moon. Events in the early 1960s heightened tensions between the two sides, causing many to fear the war would turn hot. When an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over the Soviet Union and its pilot was captured in 1960, the United States was forced to admit to conducting a program of aerial reconnaissance. In 1961, the U.S. backed invasion of Cuba, known as the Bay of Pigs, failed. Revealing American involvement in the plot, also that year, the Berlin Wall was built to stop the flow of emigrants out of East Germany. And becoming a visible symbol of the division between East and West. And in 1962, U.S. President John Kennedy, 1917 to 1963, and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, 1894 to 1971, squared off in the Cuban Missile Crisis. A full-scale conflict was averted through diplomacy. Later in the decade and into the 1970s, tensions relaxed and both sides began agreeing to limit the arms race. Signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 and the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Salt I, in 1972, and agreeing to the Helsinki Accords in 1975 but East and West remained suspicious and watchful of each other into the 1980s. Most observers agree the Cold War did not come to an end. Until the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, see 1990.
Why were there two continental congresses? Both meetings were called in reaction to British Parliament's attempts to assert its control in the American colonies. When colonial delegates to the First Continental Congress met, they developed a plan but were obviously prepared for it not to work. Since even before dismissal they agreed to reconvene if it were necessary to do so. In short, the first Congress developed Plan A, the second resorted to Plan B. Which was one last appeal to the King, and then to Plan C, finally declaring independence from Britain. The first Continental Congress convened on September 5, 1774, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The meeting was largely a reaction to the so-called intolerable acts or the coercive acts, which British Parliament had passed in an effort to control Massachusetts after the rebellion of the Boston Tea Party, December 1773. Sentiment grew among the colonists that they would need to band together in order to challenge British authority. Soon 12 colonies dispatched 56 delegates to a meeting in Philadelphia. The 13th colony, Georgia, declined to send representatives but agreed to go along with whatever plan was developed. Delegates included Samuel Adams, 1722 to 1803 George Washington 1732 to 1799 Patrick Henry 1736 to 1799 John Adams 1735 to 1826 and John Jay 1745 to 1829 Each colony had one vote and when the meeting ended on October 26, the outcome was this. The Congress petitioned the King, declaring that the British Parliament had no authority over the American colonies. That each colony could regulate its own affairs. And that the colonies would not trade with Britain until Parliament rescinded its trade and taxation policies. The petition stopped short of proclaiming independence from Great Britain. But the delegates agreed to meet again the following May if necessary. But King George III, 1738-1820, was determined that the British Empire be preserved at all costs. He believed that if the Empire lost the American colonies, then there may be a domino effect with other British possessions encouraged to also demand independence. He feared these losses would render Great Britain a minor state, rather than the power it was. Britain unwilling to lose control in America In April 1775 fighting broke out between the Redcoats and Patriots at Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. So, as agreed, the colonies again sent representatives to Philadelphia. Convening the Second Continental Congress on May 10, delegates including George Washington, John Hancock, 1737 to 1793, Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826, and Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790 organized and prepared for the fight. Creating the Continental Army and naming Washington as its commander-in-chief. With armed conflict already underway, the Congress nevertheless moved slowly toward proclaiming independence from Britain. On July 10, 
two days after issuing a declaration to take up arms. Congress made another appeal to King George III, hoping to settle the matter without further conflict. The attempt failed, and the following summer the Second Continental Congress approved the Declaration of Independence. Breaking off all ties with the mother country. What is no drama? It is the oldest form of traditional Japanese drama, dating to a D1383. It is rooted in the principles of Zen Buddhism, a religion emphasizing meditation, discipline, and the transition of truth from master to disciple. History and legend are the subjects of no plays, which are traditionally performed on a bear. Wooden stage by masked male actors who performed the story using highly controlled movements. The drama is accompanied by a chorus, which chants lines from the play. The art form was pioneered by actor dramatist Moto Kiyozimi, 1363 to 1443, when he was 20 years old. Zimi had begun acting at age seven and went on to write more than half of the roughly 250 no dramas that are still performed today. What are the characteristics of medieval times? Although the Middle Ages were shadowed by poverty, ignorance, economic chaos, bad government, and the plague, it was also a period of cultural and artistic achievement. For example, the university originated in medieval Europe. The first university was established in 1158 in Bologna, Italy. The period was marked by the belief, based on the Christian faith, that the universe is an ordered world, ruled by an infinite and all-knowing God. This belief persisted even through the turmoil of wars and social upheavals. And it is evident in the soaring Gothic architecture, such as the Cathedral of Chartres. France the poetry of Dante Alighieri, 1265-1321, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, 1225-1274, the Gregorian chant, and the music of such composers as Guillaume de Macot, c. 1300-1377. Who was the first physician in history? The first physician known by name was Imhotep, an Egyptian who lived about 2600 B. C. Also considered a sage, Imhotep lived at a time when the Egyptians were making progress in medicine. The advances included a textbook on the treatment of wounds, broken bones, and even tumors. Imhotep was later worshipped as a god by the Egyptians. Who was Dolly the sheep?
Dolly was the first mammal cloned from the DNA of an adult animal. She was a Finn Dorset sheep born in 1996 and was hailed as a monumental scientific breakthrough when her birth was announced in early 1997. Scientists at Scotland's Rosslyn Institute used somatic cell nuclear transfer SCNT, a reproductive cloning method, to produce the lamb which carried the same nuclear DNA as the donor sheep, the cells were taken from the donor's udders. Dolly made headlines around the world and launched a public debate about the possibilities and ethics of cloning. Over the years, research groups around the world reported the cloning of mice, rats, cows, goats, rabbits pigs, a horse, a mule, and a dog. In 2003 Dolly was put to sleep, though she lived only about half. The expected 10 to 12 year lifespan for a Finn Dorset sheep, scientists who conducted a post-mortem examination of her found that other than her ailments, arthritis and lung cancer, she appeared to be normal. The celebrity sheep was the mother of six lambs, which were brought into the world the old-fashioned way. Who invented the steam engine? Like many other modern inventions, the steam engine had a long evolution. It was first conceived of by Greek scientist Hero of Alexandria in the 1st century AD. The mathematician invented many contrivances that were operated by water, steam, or compressed air. These included not only a fountain and a fire engine, but the steam engine. Many centuries later, Englishman Thomas Newcomen 1663-1729, developed an early steam engine, about 1711, that was used to pump water. He was improving on a previous design, which had been patented by another inventor in 1698. But it was Scottish inventor James Watt. 1736 to 1819, who substantially improved Newcomen's machine. Patenting his own steam-powered engine in 1769. It was the first practical steam engine, and what's many improvements to the earlier. Technology paved the way for the use of the engine in manufacturing and transportation during the Industrial Revolution. C-1750 C-1850, Britain was just on the cusp of this new age when Watt patented his engine. The steam engine was eventually replaced by more efficient devices such as the turbine. Developed in the 1800s, the electric motor, also developed in the 1800s, the internal combustion engine. First practical engine built in 1860, and the diesel engine, patented 1892. Nevertheless, James Watt's steam engine played a critical role in moving society from an agricultural to industrial based economy. Watt's legacy also includes the use of horsepower and watts as units of measure. How did the Charleston get started? The Charleston, a lively ballroom dance. 
emerged in 1923 as one of the flashy elements of the period in American history that writer F. Scott Fitzgerald, 1896-1940, dubbed the Jazz Age. Other hallmarks of the Jazz Age, also called the Roaring Twenties, were speakeasies. Since the country was in the midst of prohibition, flappers, roadsters, raccoon coats, hedonism, and iconoclasm. The optimism of the Jazz Age came to a screeching halt on October 29, 1929. When the U.S. stock market crashed. How many popes have there been? The number given by the Vatican is 265, including Pope Benedict XVI. The former German cardinal who was elected on April 19, 2005, to succeed John Paul II, 1920-2005 Other lists cite 266 popes, the discrepancy arises around Stephen II, who died in 752 after he was elected but before he could be consecrated. Except for a few brief interruptions when the papacy was vacant. The Roman Catholic Church has been led by the Pope as its visible head, and Jesus Christ as its invisible head. Since Jesus said to the Apostle Peter, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon slash this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell slash shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16:18. The Apostle Peter who was earlier called Simon and is also called Simon. Peter became the leader of the Christian community after the crucifixion of Christ. And he made Jerusalem the headquarters of his preaching in Palestine. According to second century sources. Peter traveled to Rome about 55 AD and became the city's first bishop. During the persecution of Christians under Roman Emperor Nero, 37-68 AD, Peter was crucified on Vatican Hill in the year 64. He died a martyr and was canonized. St. Peter's Church The principal church of the Christian world, is said to have been built over Peter's burial place. These events in Rome during St. Peter's time long after gave the city special status within the church. It further established the site of the Papal Palace in Vatican City, which is an independent state that lies within the city of Rome. And the majority of popes, all but 18, have been Italian, when John Paul II, who was born in Poland, was elected Pope in 1978, he was the first non-Italian Pope since 1523. Who was Balanchine? The name of the Russian-born choreographer is synonymous with modern American ballet. George Balanchine, 1904-1983, was one of the most influential choreographers of the 20th century. Creating more than 200 ballets in his lifetime and choreographing 19 Broadway musicals as well as four Hollywood films. He co-founded three of the country's foremost dance institutions. The School of American Ballet, in 1934, 
The American Ballet Company, 1935. And the New York City Ballet, 1948, the first American ballet company to become a public institution. His entrance into the world of dance was entirely accidental, in August 1914 Balanchine accompanied his sister to an audition at the Imperial School of Ballet and was invited to audition as well. Though his sister failed, he passed and, against his own wishes, was promptly enrolled. However, Balanchine remained uninterested in the art form. Even running away from school shortly after starting. The turning point for the young dancer came with a performance of Tchaikovsky's ballet The Sleeping Beauty, 1890. He was dazzled by the experience and chose to stay with the school's rigorous training program. Serenade, 1935, music by Tchaikovsky, is considered by many to be Balanchine's signature work. His other well-known works include Apollo, 1928, The Prodigal Son, 1929, The Nutcracker, 1954, and Don Quixote, 1965, as well as Jewels, the first full-length ballet without a plot. Remembering the opportunity he had been given as a child. Balanchine was known for choreographing children's roles into many of his ballets. His outreach did not end there, he organized lecture demonstration tours for schools. Gave free ballet performances for underprivileged children, conducted free annual seminars for dance teachers. And gave free advice and use of his ballets to other ballet companies. Balanchine's unparalleled body of work was instrumental in establishing the vibrant style and content of contemporary ballet in America. Where he brought ballet to the forefront of the performing arts. Who invented the computer? English mathematician Charles Babbage, 1792-1871, is recognized as the first to conceptualize the computer. He worked to develop a mechanical computing machine called the analytical engine, which is considered the prototype of the digital computer. While attending Cambridge University in 1812, Babbage conceived of the idea of a machine that could calculate data faster than could humans and without human error. These were the early years of the Industrial Revolution. And the world Babbage lived in was growing increasingly complex. Human errors in mathematical tables posed serious problems for many burgeoning industries. After graduating from Cambridge, Babbage returned to the idea of a computational aid. He spent the rest of his life and much of his fortune trying to build such a machine. But he was not to finish. Nevertheless, Babbage's never completed analytical engine, on which he began work in 1834, was the forerunner of the modern digital computer. A programmable electronic device that stores, retrieves, and processes data. Babbage's device used punch cards to store data and was intended to print answers. More than 100 years later, the first fully automatic calculator was invented. 
development began in 1939 at Harvard University. Under the direction of mathematician Howard Aiken, 1900-1973, the first electronic digital computer called Mark I, was invented in 1944. The Mark II followed in 1947. In 1946 scientists at the University of Pennsylvania completed NIAC. Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, the first all-purpose electronic digital computer. Operating on 18,000 vacuum tubes, NIAC was large. Required great deal of power to run, and generated a lot of heat. The first computer to handle both numeric and alphabetical data with equal facility was the UNIVAC. Universal Automatic Computer, developed between 1946 and 1951, also at the University of Pennsylvania. What does the Security Council do? According to the UN Charter, the functions and powers of the Security Council are to maintain international peace and security in accordance with the principles and purposes of the United Nations, to investigate any dispute or situation which might lead to international friction, to recommend methods of adjusting such disputes or the terms of settlement, to formulate plans for the establishment of a system to regulate armaments. To determine the existence of a threat to the peace or act of aggression and to Recommend what action should be taken, to call on members to apply economic sanctions and other measures. Not involving the use of force to prevent or stop aggression, to take military action against an aggressor. To recommend the admission of new members, to exercise the trusteeship functions of the United Nations in strategic areas. And to recommend to the General Assembly the appointment of the Secretary General and Together with the Assembly, to elect the judges of the International Court of Justice. What is Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda, Arabic, meaning the base, is a global network of terrorists who banded together during the 1990s and proclaimed to be carrying out a holy war on non-Islamic nations. The group knows no national boundaries, though certain nations, including Afghanistan, were known to be Al-Qaeda strongholds. Led by the elusive Osama bin Laden, 1957, a wealthy exiled Saudi, the group conducted terrorist training programs in several Muslim, mostly Middle Eastern, countries and was funded by loyalists around the world. One of the United States' first actions following the September 11, 2001, terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon, which were later confirmed to have been carried out by Al-Qaeda operatives, was to freeze bank accounts of persons and organizations with suspected ties to the terrorist group. The roots of Al-Qaeda can be traced to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, when thousands of Muslims, including bin Laden, joined the Afghan resistance. The 10-year conflict was a rallying point for Islamic extremists. 
Ben Laden returned home to Saudi Arabia in 1989, determined to perpetuate a holy war, jihad, by maintaining the funding, organization, and training that had made the Afghan resistance victorious against the Soviets. By the early 1990s he emerged as a leader in the Muslim world. Proclaiming his goal to reinstate the caliphate, a unified Muslim state. He also proclaimed the United States to be an enemy to Islam. He considered the nation responsible for all conflicts involving Muslims. The Saudi government rescinded his passport in 1994, and bin Laden fled his homeland. He eventually found safe harbor in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. According to the report issued by the 9-11 Commission, bin Laden's declaration of war came in February 1998. When he and fugitive Egyptian physician Ayman al- Zawahiri arranged from their Afghanistan headquarters for an Arabic newspaper in London to publish what they termed a fatwa issued in the name of a World Islamic Front. The statement claimed that America had declared war against God and his messenger and they called for retaliation. Under bin Laden's direction, Al-Qaeda carried out several attacks on American targets, including the August 7, 1998, bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, which killed 258 and injured 5,000, and the September 11, 2001, attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon, which killed nearly 3,000 people. After the global coalition against terrorism, led by U.S. forces, launched its attack on Afghanistan in October 2001, bin Laden was believed to have fled for Pakistan. Capturing him and other al-Qaeda leaders and operatives was the key objective of the United States in its efforts to dismantle the terrorist network. What is the war on terror? In his remarks the evening of September 11, 2001, President George W. Bush, 1946, vowed that America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. TV newscasts were soon emblazoned with the message. America's War on Terror, or simply, the War on Terror. The events of 9-11 catapulted the free world into a new era. In which conflicts no longer were limited to wars between nations. There was a new enemy, which knew no national boundaries. Whose army was covered, and which mercilessly targeted civilians. Acknowledging that the new threat could not be met by the United States alone. The Bush administration began forging an alliance of nations that together would use diplomacy, take military action and coordinate intelligence and law enforcement efforts to combat terrorists around the globe. On September 12, 2001, Secretary of State Colin Powell, 1937, called for a global coalition against terrorism. Eventually the Bush administration put together an alliance of 84 countries. 
called the Global Coalition Against Terrorism, united against a common danger, and joined in a common purpose. The strike on Afghanistan, called Operation Enduring Freedom, was the first military strategy in the new war. The next major initiative was the war in Iraq. While those operations were underway, terrorist strikes continued around the globe. In March 2004, following the commuter train blasts in Spain, President Bush remarked that the murders in Madrid are a reminder that the civilized world is at war. And in this new kind of war, civilians find themselves suddenly on the front lines. In recent years, terrorists have struck from Spain, to Russia, to Israel, to East Africa, to Morocco, to the Philippines, and to the United States. They've targeted Arab states such as Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Yemen. They've attacked Muslims in Indonesia, Turkey, Pakistan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. No nation or region is exempt from the terrorists' campaign of violence. How long was it before someone reached the east by sailing west? It was not until 1520 that a route was found. Portuguese navigator Ferdinand Magellan, c. 1480-1521, was on an expedition for Spain when he found a southwest passage, which took him around the southern tip of South America, through a winding waterway that still bears his name, the Strait of Magellan. Having set out from Spain in September 1519, it was a full year later before Magellan, born for Neo de Magalhães, and known in Spain as Fernando de Magallanes, reached this point. South of the South American mainland and north of the Tierra del Fuego island chain, today these islands are part of Argentina and Chile. And this was only after he had crushed a mutiny. Nevertheless, Magellan had found a connection between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. He sailed on from there, reaching the island we know as Guam on March 6, 1521. Ten days later, he discovered the Philippines. On the Philippine island of Cebu, he made an alliance with a treacherous native sovereign for whom he undertook an expedition to the nearby island of Macton. It was there that Magellan met with his death in April 1521. His expedition continued without him. Under the direction of Juan Sebastián de Elcano, c. 1476 to 1526, who in 1522 returned to Seville, Spain. Along with 18 other survivors of the Magellan expedition. Their cargo, aboard the ship Vittoria. Included valuable spices which more than paid for the expense of the expedition. Who were the Huns? The Huns were a nomadic Central Asian people who, in the middle of the 4th century A.D., moved westward. They first defeated the Alani, a group in the Caucasus mountain region. 
between the Black and the Caspian Seas, and then conquered and drove out the Goths. Unified by the ruler Attila in 434, the Huns gained control of a large part of Central and Eastern Europe by about 450. The Italian countryside was ravaged in the process. And many people sought refuge on the numerous islands in the lagoon of Venice, the settlement later became the city of Venice. With the death of Attila in 453, the subjects of the Huns revolted and defeated them. The Huns were later absorbed into the various peoples of Europe. Why was Voltaire exiled from France? The French writer Voltaire, 1694-1778, born François-Marie Arouet, Voltaire was an assumed name. Was imprisoned twice during his lifetime, he was released the second time on the condition that he leave the country. The prison terms and expulsion were the result of Voltaire's expert satire which first got him into trouble when he was a young man. After finishing a course of study at the Jesuit School College Louis Le Grand, 1704-11, Voltaire joined a group of aristocrats in Paris who valued the young writer's wit. He wrote and circulated verse criticizing the regent, the Duc d'Orleans. As a result of these offensive works, Voltaire was put into the Bastille, in 1717, where he began writing an epic, The Henriad, about France's King Henry IV, 1553-1610, full of indictments of religious fanaticism and praise for toleration. The work proved highly controversial in its day. Such anti-establishment protests eventually led the writer to have an argument with the Chevalier de Rohan, a member of one of France's most powerful families. This conflict resulted in Voltaire's arrest, imprisonment, again in the Bastille, and exile to England in 1726. He stayed in London until 1729. Returning to France, the writer penned his observations on English social and political beliefs. Letters Concerning the English Nation, 1734 Again stirring a controversy his exaltation of English liberalism was viewed by the authorities as a criticism of French conservatism. He fled the trouble by going into seclusion in Lorraine, where he stayed through 1749. The Biting Criticism of his works won the writer fame as well as controversy, both of which followed him throughout his life. In 1750 he was invited to visit Prussian King Frederick the Great at court, accepting. He stayed there only two years he was forced to leave in 1753 after quarreling with the man he called the Philosopher King. He spent the last 20 years of his life in Switzerland. Returning to Paris to see a performance of one of his plays, Irene, just before his death. How old is golf? Some historians trace golf back to a Roman game called Paganica. When they occupied Great Britain between roughly AD 43 until 410. 
Romans played the game in the streets, using a stick and a leather ball. But there are other possible predecessors as well, including an English game, called Kambuka. A Dutch game, Kalf, a French and Belgian game called, Chol, and a French game, Jeu de Mail. But the game as we know it, the rules, equipment, and 18 whole course. Certainly developed in Scotland, where it was played as early as the early 1400s. The rules of the game were also codified there, the rules of golf was published in 1754 by the St. Andrews Golfers, later called the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. The first golf club, formed 1744, was the Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers in Edinburgh, Scotland. And it was none other than Mary, Queen of Scots, 1542-1587, who is credited with being both the first woman golfer and the originator of the term caddy. The term is derived from the French term for the royal pages, cadets, who carried the Queen's clubs. How did Greek civilization begin? Ancient Greek civilization began with the Minoans. Europe's first advanced civilization, the Minoans were a prosperous and peaceful people who flourished. On the Mediterranean island of Crete from about 3000 to 1450 BC, the Minoans built structures from stone, plaster, and timbers, painted walls with brilliant frescoes, made pottery, wove and dyed cloth, cultivated the land. They are believed to be the first people to produce an agricultural surplus, which they exported. Constructed stone roads and bridges, and built highly advanced drainage systems and aqueducts. At Knossos, the royal family had a system for showers and even had toilets that could be flushed. Minoans were a sophisticated people who loved music and dance, games, and entertainment. What is karma? Karma is a belief shared by several Asian religions including Buddhism and Hinduism. The basic concept is that the position one holds in this life is a result of one's actions and conduct in previous lives or incarnations. Therefore, actions and thoughts in this life can influence one's future destiny. The goal of many Eastern religions is to be freed from the cycle of karma by following certain religious practices. The word originates from the Sanskrit karma, meaning work or fate. What was the Trail of Tears? The Trail of Tears was the government-enforced western migration of the American Indians, which began March 25, 1838, as an increasing number of white settlers moved inland from the coastal areas. They laid claim to Indian homelands, conflicts ensued. The government's solution was to relocate the Indians to make room for the pioneers. 
as many as 17,000 members of the Cherokee Nation were forced from tribal lands in Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, and were escorted west by federal troops under the command of General Winfield Scott. 1786-1866, along an 800-mile trail that followed the Tennessee-Ohio, Mississippi, and Arkansas rivers to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, north of the Red River. The journey took between 93 and 139 days, and the movement westward was called the Trail of Tears Knot. Only because it was a journey the native people did not wish to make, to a place where they did not wish to go. But because an estimated 4,000 people mostly infants, children, and the elderly died en route. The deaths were caused by sickness, including measles, whooping cough, pneumonia, and tuberculosis. Escorted in waves, it was a full year spring of 1839, before the Cherokee had been relocated. Some 1,000 had refused to leave their tribal lands in the southeast. The forced migration thus resulted in the fragmentation and weakening of the tribe. What were the Jim Crow laws? They were laws or practices that segregated blacks from whites. They prevailed in the American South during the late 1800s and into the first half of the 1900s. Jim Crow was a stereotype of a black man described in a 19th century song and dance act. The first written appearance of the term is dated 1838. And by the 1880s it had fallen into common usage in the United States. Even though in 1868 Congress passed the 14th Amendment, prohibiting states from violating equal protection of all citizens. Southern states passed many laws segregating blacks from whites in public places. In short, the laws were both manifestation and enforcement of discrimination. Thanks to the Civil Rights Movement. The laws were finally found to be unconstitutional during the 1950s and 1960s. When did the Big Band era begin? On December 1, 1934, Benny Goodman's Let's Dance was broadcast on network radio, which effectively launched the swing era, in which big band music achieved huge popularity. Goodman, 1909-1986, was a virtuoso clarinetist and band leader. His jazz-influenced dance band took the lead in making swing the most popular style of the time. Is bluegrass music a distinctly American genre? Yes, the style of music developed out of country music during the late 1930s and throughout the 1940s. Bill Monroe, 1911-1996, a country and bluegrass singer-songwriter, altered the tempo, key, pitch, and instrumentation of traditional country music to create a new style named for the band that originated it. Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, Monroe's home state was Kentucky.
Bluegrass was first heard by a white audience when in October 1939. Monroe and his band appeared on the popular country music radio program The Grand Ole Opry. Although bluegrass evolved through several stages and involved a host of contributors. Through it all Bill Monroe remained the guiding and inspirational force. And therefore merits the distinction of being the father of bluegrass. When were the first schools established? The first formal education began shortly after the development of writing, c. 3000 BC, when both the Sumerians, who had developed a cuneiform system of pictographics, and the Egyptians, who developed hieroglyphics, established schools to teach students to read and write the systems. After the development of the first alphabet, between 1800 and 1000 BC, by Semitic people in Syria, religious schools were set up. Priests taught privileged boys to read sacred Hebrew writings, the Torah. The first school that was open to everyone, not just the upper classes, may well have been that established by Chinese philosopher Confucius, 551 to 479 BC who taught literature and music conduct and ethics to anyone who wanted to learn the Western model of education is based on the ancient Greek schools which were founded about the 5th century BC in the city-state of Sparta Boys were not only trained for the military, they also learned reading and writing and studied music. In Athens, boys learned to read and write, memorized poetry, and learned music as well as trained in athletics. In the second half of the 5th century BC, the Sophists, ancient Greek teachers of rhetoric and philosophy, schooled young men in the social and political arts, hoping to mold them into ideal statesmen. What were the intolerable acts? The so-called intolerable acts, also known as the Coercive Acts. Were five laws passed by the British Parliament early in 1774, intended to assert British authority in the Massachusetts colony. The measures were seen as punishment for the Boston Tea Party, December 1773. In brief, the laws enacted the following, closure of the Port of Boston. An English trial for any British officer or soldier who was charged with murder in the colonies. The change of the Charter of Massachusetts such that the council had to be appointed by the British and that town meetings could not be held without the British appointed, governor's permission, the requirement that the colonists house and feed British soldiers and the extension of the province of Quebec southward to the Ohio River. While the British intention was to bring the Massachusetts colony under control. And actually the Fifth Act was not intended to have any punitive effect on the colony. The result was instead to unite all the colonies in opposition to British rule. In this regard, the acts are seen as a precursor to the American Revolution, 
What is the Y accord? Officially called the Y River Memorandum. The accord outlined a limited and interim land for peace settlement between Israel and Palestine. It was signed October 23, 1998, by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, 1949. And Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, 1929 to 2004, at a summit held at Y Mills, on the banks of Maryland's Y River. The meeting was the follow-up to the 1993 Middle East Summit in Oslo, Norway. There, after months of talks, both sides agreed to an interim framework of Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The Y meeting was the opportunity for both sides to make good on the promises made in Oslo. The Y Accord was brokered after a 21-hour bargaining session mediated by U.S. President Bill Clinton. 1946. The points of the agreement included developing a security plan to crack down on terrorism. The withdrawal of Israeli troops from an additional 13% of the West Bank, along with a commitment for future additional withdrawals. A transfer of roughly 14% of the West Bank from joint Israeli-Palestinian control to Palestinian control. Palestinian agreement that anti-Israeli clauses in its national charter would be removed. Israel's guarantee that it would provide two corridors of safe passage between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Israeli release of 750 Palestinian prisoners, and the opening of a Palestinian airport in Gaza. The Knesset, Israel's parliament, approved the accords on November 17, 1998. But by December, Israel suspended its obligations in the Y, citing Palestinian failure to comply with the accords. Benjamin Netanyahu's successor, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, 1942, pledged to resume implementing the Y Accord but at the same time delayed its timetable, saying the measures should be included in a final peace agreement with the Palestinians. On September 4, 1999, the two sides met again at Sharm al Sheikh. Egypt, where they agreed on a new timetable for the Y. That document was signed by Barak and the Palestinian authorities Arafat and was witnessed by diplomats from Egypt, Jordan, and the United States, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. But both Barak and Arafat faced mounting political opposition at home. Posing immediate challenges to the revised agreement, which stalled again. 